good evening friends uh, thank you dr sahu for giving me this opportunity uh, after uh, discussing the pre operative management of patient with ca head and neck cancer or cheek i will be taking you to journey of intra operative and post operative management of patients with carcinoma head and neck or cheek starting with the case so we often get a case of 69 year old male patients basically may be hypertensive or chronic smoker uh, they may present with a non healing ulcer uh, in the tongue or the lateral border of the cheek and the airways examination we do and we found no mouth opening is usually normal no mo mo neck movements are normal and but there is some issue with protrusion of the tongue and they may have received uh, an ACT and a plan for a wide local excision with or without a flap which may be a free flap or a pms another case uh, a 64 year old male presented with cheek complaints of swelling for 5 months on the cheek difficulty in opening the mouth and pain and swelling since 2 months in addition to the presenting complaints as anesthetist we are more concerned about other things uh, which may affect our anesthesia plan so we need to ask about history of bleeding or discharge from the swelling history of loss of appetite loss of weight any history of tobacco chewing bd smoking history of uh, facial trauma joint pain fever or swelling history of rt to the head or neck and chemotherapy because these drugs or radiation therapy may affect a lot of things uh, systemic issues might be there which may have which may force us to change the anesthetic plan and then history of dysphagia postnasal or stridor so broadly the anesthetic concerns can be divided into three so those related to age or comorbidities related to the primary disease or malignancy and because of the shared area i'll come to it one by one so the age related concerns maybe they may be cardiac issues like decrease in cardiac output uh, then they may be pulmonary issues like po2 may be decreased then there may be hepatic issues renal dysfunction changes and in addition to age related changes patient might have some comorbidities like hypertension diabetes copd many of them do have copd because they are uh, or chronic smokers and is, as it is a risk factor and they have a poor chest condition then cancer related issues like a patient might have received chemotherapy radiotherapy they might be metabolic and nutritional issues usually they are not able to have a good appetite uh, plus they have there is a difficulty in eating so they are malnourished the albumin will be low they will be anemic so these all make the perioperative management more complex then there might be psychological issues uh, which may be difficult uh, to handle and in addition patients are usually on opioids because of the pain patient is experience experiencing and we need to modify the dose of opioids which we are giving in the intraoperative and the postoperative period and all of us know it is a difficult airway so usually anticipated but there might be some un unanticipated areas as well so we have to be very careful in such patients and in addition to intubation we need to plan their extubation and post extubation care so along with the anesthetic issues there are a lot of surgical issues so we need to know about what is the primary diagnosis what is a surgical plan so whether it is a wle or a section and what kind of repair they want to do what whether to do a plate fixation whether to do a pmmc whether they do a free flap and those things and uh, because this will determine the duration of surgery this will determine the airway management plan this will determine the amount of invasive monitoring we need to do and uh, since most of them we have a common airway sharing so we, this is a major concern that we'll be sharing the airway with the surgeons and we need to be really careful while surgeons are operating there have been incidences of ex accidental extubation and such it may lead to a catastrophe now this is a quite a common picture i am sure most of us must have done so the, we we know a patient which have a reduced mouth opening we have Air oral dental hygiene is usually poor. Malam patti is poor because mouth opening is not there. They are not able to protrude the tongue properly. Now, neck movements is usually normal. Upper lip height test is grade three. The neck distances appear normal, and the systemic examination is normal. Another patient, we have a reduced mouth opening of two centimeters. The teeth teeth are protruding, so we have bug teeth. Mandible protrusion is appears to be normal. Malam patti is grade four, and then this TMD eight centimeter. neck thickness is 14 inches and head and neck movements are usually normal so the point which comes to is once we assess the patient the the important thing we need to assess broadly is whether we do a awake intubation or a intubation under ge and these are other such cases we have mass in the tongue this lower 
jaw is involved along with the oral cavity, then again the jaw involvement, then the lip involvement. And this is a major uh, contention for an aesthetic that whether we do an awake or GA. So all this will depend upon the airway conditions, considerations. So we know we need to know the site of the tumor, the pharyngeal laryngeal tumors. We currently have residual fluid debris at the laryngoscopy, which may interfere with the view. And what is the size of the tumor, whether it is distorting the oral cavity or the floor of the mouth is involved, how much mouth opening do we have? Then what are the post-operative concerns like edema, contractures, and flaps? patient if has received rt may have trismus fibrosis or mycositis then there may be osteoridal necrosis mycositis so all these things will also come into picture when we trying to making a plan for the airway management so uh, in a sense uh, these patients may have a difficult fake mass ventilation they may have difficult laryngoscopy they may have a difficult intubation they may have a difficult front of neck because of uh, radiation induced fibrosis in the neck or they may be having a combination of these so we need to assess what are areas of difficulty and what areas are actually available. So that will help us categorize the plan A, B, C for that individualized patient. Now for and approaching the airway, we need to take a proper history. We need to, uh, Rakesh has uh, very well illustrated the history point. So I will not go into detail and the physical examination and the focused airway examination and uh, investigations uh, if needed, like laryngoscopy, uh, fiber optic or indirect a cervical spine, X-ray, CT, MRI, and flow volume loops. In a sense, all this uh, history, examination, and investigation will help us to formulate our best plans for that particular patient. Now, the important issue is whenever we do a conventional assessment of airway, as we know, because of the nature of the disease, so the commonly used tests like Malampati, thoromental distance, sternomental distance, the Wilson score, mouth opening, job protection, all of them, they have a low sensitivity and specificity and they have a predictive value is also not very good. So the problem is that even though they, you may find it difficult, they eventually they turn to be simple. And if you find it to be simple on test, they eventually turn to be difficult. So we are not very, very sure whether how effective are these. So now here comes the role of ultrasound. No, it is like an stethoscope for all of us. And we know uh, ultrasound can help us do a dynamic assessment of the airway. Basically, it taps the difference in acoustic impedance between the soft tissues and air, reflects sound waves. And this is basically air mucosal interface uh, basically is being reflected and you make assessment of this. So these are the normal uh, parameters which can be assessed using ultrasound. So we can use a base of the tongue. We can, the hired bone can be assessed. Then we can have the distance from hired bone uh, to the skin then distance from the skin to the epiglottis, then uh, soft tissue thickness at the level of the thyroid membrane, and distance from the skin to the commissure of the true vocal cords, and soft tissue levels at the thyroid isthmus, and soft tissue at the level of the suprasternal. So though we do not have the cutoff predictive values, but yes, they, will all, they do help us to assess the dynamic part of the airway and how it may behave when we are anesthetizing and managing the airway. So once we have done the assessment based on history, examination, clinical examination, the various tests and ultrasound, we need to, we know it is a difficult airway and it has to be done usually nosily. So we need to make a plan depending on the experience, ensuring patient safety. And we have to keep in mind whether a patient will have a post-operative jaw wiring or not, depending on the surgery. One important thing is that we need, the three important basically you can say safe zones for anesthetists. So we, we need to be ensuring that patient is, we can bag and mask ventilate. We may be able, to, we should be able to put in a supraglottic and we may be able to put in an endotracheal tube intubation. And if uh, none of these is possible, such patients are definitely away. So you can see this patient in the picture, big intraoral cavity mouth, in the oral cavity, big mass, and it, you cannot actually put in an SGA Endotracheal tube, you may not be able to insert nasally also. Bag and mask is definitely difficult. And such patients should definitely be done awake. Now, uh, everybody talks about difficult airway, and it, but it is actually, no airway is a difficult. It is difficult to have such kind of definition and label somebody as a difficult airway or an easy airway. Rather, it is a complex interplay and it all depends upon patient, practitioner, 
equipment expertise and circumstances so something which may be difficult for me may be easy for some other anesthetists who is doing such patients very very regularly so there was a time when we used to do oral cancer patients say once a month or twice a month so we used to be really worried and it was very difficult for us to uh, intubate and we we used to arrange a lot of things and but nowadays we are doing practically one every day and so the oral cancer patients are not so difficult for us so it all depends upon the practice and expertise and the available equipment and we, we one needs to customize the plans depending upon the availability of equipment and the expertise and whenever we do the assessment we need to classify what all are possible in this patient and what all things are not possible so airway management foundation recently come up with this guidelines and uh, so they have uh, specifically done the line of sight approach and what is important is after assessment whether we will be able bag and mask is easy or difficult acid is easy or difficult intubation is easy or difficult and front of neck is easy or difficult so these are the basic four decisions which will help us planning the airway now broadly uh, patients uh, in these patients the decisions to be taken are whether we do a surgical or a non invasive technique whether we do awake or intubation after induction of anesthesia whether we preserve spontaneous ventilation or we do it uh, without uh, with abolition of spontaneous and what is the appropriate device for management uh, coming to awake intubation so awake intubation uh, is the safe haven for most of us we think so uh, and the risk of complications if sedatives and or muscle relaxants are administered prior to airway control are much much less so if we do not give sedatives no muscle relaxants so patient is fully awake so uh, things are pretty much in control however there are a lot of issues with awake we will be discussing it in subsequent slides then uh, the quick look is a good option so patient might be sedated and we can have a quick direct laryngoscopy view without any muscle relaxant to see what actually is inside the patient then uh, we can always uh, do induction and paralysis so uh, if we perceive a low risk of difficulty in laryngoscopy or mask ventilation when we are reasonably sure of ability to ventilate and laryngoscopy then we can always induce the patients and paralyze so this is the modality we are using of most often nowadays but uh, you uh, but uh, i will not recommend this for everybody because it we have been doing it very regularly we do about 150 to 200 cases an, an year and so we are comfort we know when when not to do this so that that is more important so this is one of the modality and you have to be careful while uh, choosing the right technique when in doubt it is always good to do an awake intubation then this is the most important part so uh, whenever uh, any any kind of uh critical situation we are in we always plan for a backup when we are driving a car we all of us have a stepney in the car so identifying the cricothyroid membrane for subsequent cricothyroid dotomy in case of need like a cico is like a stepney for an aesthetist all of us must make an habit to identify a cricothyroid membrane pre operatively before induction or planning for an airway in every patient especially who are an anticipated difficult we can do it without using an ultrasound but i would su suggest that it will be it will be better if you use an ultrasound because it gives you a real kind of picture and actually you can mark it so i will not go into details how to do it but important thing is you must know and we need to identify the pearl of strings structure then sudden bump up which is the cricoid cartilage then a thyroid cartilage and we should identify the cricothyroid membrane and we need to mark it with a pen on the skin so that we can always puncture it if needed in addition if you are planning an awake intubation this may help us to give a transtracheal or a recurrent laryngeal nerve block to prepare the airway and we also get a practice that will in the sense that we will be able we will be able to puncture the cricothyroid membrane in case of need of emergency so uh, it is a good practice i sincerely feel that if you are doing an awake intubation it will be good to do a, a, a cpm puncture for a local anesthesia as well to be sure that you will be able to do it in case of emergencies then whatever airway technique we may use whatever gadget we may use oxygenation is the key we must understand patient die not because of failure to intubate but failure to oxygenate so we should always oxygenate in whatever form whatever method we use so we always pre oxygenate this patient so end point is end tidal oxygen of more than 0.9 
what this does is it increases the apneic window it allows more controlled and less hurried and more careful instrumentation and reduces the deterioration to a cico scenario so what are the methods so there are many all of us know we can use vital capacity capacity breaths we use cpap we use tidal ventilations for 3 5 7 minutes we use propped up position end point is that whatever method we may use the fio2 should be more than 0.9 then uh, paroxygenation so when we are done with preoxygenation we are doing airway management we are trying planning we are doing an intubation using whatever method but during the process of airway management we can use a paroxygenation technique it may be a no deset it may be try it may we may use a direct pharyngeal insufflation we may use a buccal oxygen delivery so whatever method you use you must give oxygen during the handling of the airway as well this helps you to extend the time for desaturation during attempts of screwing the airway pre oxygenation increases the duration of apnea without desaturation from 1 to 2 minutes to 5 to 6 minutes while para oxygenation increases this further now coming to awake intubation Awake intubation: tracheal tube is placed awake in a spontaneously breathing patient before induction of GA, most commonly with a FOB or a video laryngoscope. Advantages are: it it has a favorable safety profile, spontaneous ventilation, and intrinsic airway tone is maintained until the trachea is intubated. So we are very sure that things are in under control, and we do not paralyze the patient. We don't give muscle relaxation. We don't give Uh, an inhalation or IV induction breath till we are reasonably sure and trachea is intubated with the endotracheal tube. It allows the patient to maintain gas exchange, airway potency, and protection against aspiration. However, awake is not the gold standard for all the patients, and there was a recent article in BJA which suggested that they, we need to stratify the patients between low and high risk, and then then an ability. to deal with those patient identified as difficult high risk patient should be intubated awake to avoid complications and uh, and the risk the success of stratification may not be possible 100% of times but yes we need to know that awake intubation is also has some challenges and we need to be careful the, then recently there is a difficult airway society das guidelines for awake critical intubation and this was uh, being it was in 2019 now they have a uh, not intended to represent minimum practice nor it is a substitute for a good clinical judgment they basically presented the key principles and have suggested for preparation performance consent and training to inform clinical practice and this have to be used appropriately by the trained appropriate uh, operators so basically it uh, consists of das api uh, technique consists of topicalization sedation oxygenation and performance and uh, we need to see how topicalize the airway using a lignogen spray or we can use uh, other methods then we need to sedate with remifentanil which we do not have in india we usually use a combination of low dose fentanyl and midazolam oxygenation is the key whatever method we may use and we have to perform the intubation similarly uh, managing procedural complications we need to ensure that uh, we may do additional topicalization because patient might be uh, may struggle during intubation so up to 9 mg per kg can be used lignocaine for uh, la preparation preparation of the airway however la toxicity may still occur we need to re review the regimes of sedation if needed uh, we have to limit the attempts because more the attempts there is a ch increased chances of bleeding and and complications so they they have suggested limitation to 3 plus 1 attempts i'll go a step further we should not uh, we should limit to maximum 3 and uh, we should be ready to abandon the procedure if we are not very comfortable in intubating and there is a repeated failure and we should think of alternate route or device and change the type of tube it might sometimes help and it is always good to call for an experienced help so when we are preparing for awake a psychological counseling is very important we need to consent uh, from the patient we need to do an optimal pre medication always give glycopyrrolate uh, to reduce secretions it is a good idea to give a low dose fentanyl and midazolam or a dexamethasone uh, depending on the availability and expertise 
and topicalization the method is your choice you may do uh, using a spray you may use a uh, nebulization you may use nerve blocks uh, so depending on uh, the need but the only thing is that whatever method may you, you may use you have to wait for the contact time of local anesthetic and for this action to occur you should wait for at least uh, for nebulization you may have to wait a little longer for block the effect comes within say 5 to 10 minutes and you have to wait that time before you start do doing the procedure then uh, we have to ensure that uh, operator can readily see the patient monitor in fusion pumps and video screen and uh, one must be having all the equipment ready including the buji all kind of video laryngoscopes laryngoscopes bronchoscope so that as they can be used in case of a need and failure of a primary technique and the nerve uh, nerve blocks we have discussed so we can use a super laryngeal nerve block or uh, by identifying a thyroid bone using a ultrasound and this in combination with a trans transtacal nerve block or a recurrent laryngeal nerve block is very very effective then preparation of awake intubation uh, sedation uh, is needed because we, it tends to depress consciousness but problem is it may predispose the patient to aspiration so we have to be very very careful so if there is retching and gagging uh, while doing the procedure if you are not prepared the airway well there can be regurgitation which may lead to aspiration and in addition application of la may lead to depressed laryngeal reflexes and which may lead to an aspiration so we need to be very very careful when we are doing awake we need to be preparing the airway well we need to use a uh, sedation very very cautiously and we have to be very careful and has to be done in an experienced hands in addition there are many problems of awake intubation so they may be lim so they can be it can be time consuming it can be distressing to the patient we, are, we may not be experienced enough, so it is a potential recipe for a trouble. It may, may lead to bleeding, increased hemodynamic response, not a good choice in patients with hypertension, CAD. In children, mentally retarded, they may not cooperate, so obviously cannot do awake. Uh, there can be suboptimal conditions because all of us know the best intubating condition is patients fully anesthetized and vocal cord fertilized. Then patient might have an allergy to a LA. There can be all airway bleeding. There can be diffusal from the patient. So uh, it is not that all patients need to be done awake. So you need to choose the right patients and the right technique while managing the airway. And till date, we do not have an, any individual validated predicted assessment tool to, us, to categorically say that this patient has to be done awake. And this was an interesting article. So they had... Uh, assess the feelings of the patient and so so the patient said it sounded are so nasty and i do not really know what instruments look like i thought oh god how will it be done i'm imagining some big instrument that would put, put down my throat another patient said it was uncomfortable and to get something in your throat but i went well and i got sedated so you feel calm but it was still unpleasant so what i'm trying to say is it may not be a good uh, kind of experience for the patient and we should not do awake unless it is very very much indicated and there's no other choice with us but awake intubation in a setting and this is another editorial which has said that with the development of these devices and drugs so and the need for awake intubation has much much decreased and we if we do a good preoperative imaging and we take a multidisciplinary discussion with our surgeons and radiology colleagues then we can do away without doing an awake intubation and we can plan accordingly and uh, the idea is that we need to do best for the patient which causes least trouble to them now once we are intubating so uh, we we know we have uh, backup choices as intubation sed face mask and if some nothing is possible then cico scenario and uh, we need to be prepared with uh, the adjuncts appropriate size suctioning and muscle tone uh, try to maintain if you're not very very sure but but what the problem is that once none of the things are possible so we are not able to intubate we are not able to put in sad and we are not able to oxygenate using a face mask then we may need to do a surgical access so it may be a transtracheal jet ventilation it may be a cricothyroidectomy or a tracheostomy or we need if you have time and patient, uh, there, there is a possibility we may have to wake up the patient from time. And we all of us dread this cannot intubate, cannot 
ventilate situation however we need to be prepared with it and we need to be very very sure what we'll be doing because it, it is kind of an emergency and we don't have much time say about two to three minutes to act and whatever we do will decide the fate of the patient now in cico situation uh, the if you find one you need to first declare it to cico call for help additional staff and rescue trolley it is a good idea to give a neuromuscular blocking agent once the cico occurs because you have to have a definitive airway and for best airway management plan the patient has to be relaxed you cannot do a cricothyroid puncture in a struggling patient you end up in a problem and then you have to identify ctm i earlier told you also so we need to pre identify and mark it and this is the laryngeal handshake uh, or larsen's uh, laryngeal handshake we do to identify the cricothyroid membrane and the method is tab and twist buji in the tube so we need three techniques three things for an emergency front of neck access so we need a number 10 scalpel buji with a cordative and a number 6 cuffed endotracheal tube the numbers and the sizes are very very important then uh, first we do a stab and then twist with a sharp and facing cordially during the process we are oxygenating continuously this is very important then we insert the buji with cordative through it and then we rail road the sex number tube uh, over the buji and then we can ventilate using an ambu bag so this is a very important technique you may get it as a short note in addition uh, it it is clinically useful as well so you must be knowing and any difficulty ever case you may be asked about efona in the exam so we have done about identification and this will skip uh, another important question is whether we do a scalpel or a, a cannula cricothyroidotomy so well uh, it depends upon your expertise and the availability the success rate of crico surgical crico are about 100% while the cannula and uh, crico thyroidotomy are about 30 to 50 percent. However, the best cricothyroidotomy probably will be one that we do not. That remains that one we do perform very regularly. So, jo, whatever we are good at or we know how the procedure, we should be doing that. Now, once the airway is management, there are other considerations as well uh, for such patients. So, we have general considerations like we need to follow the WHO checklist. Standard monitoring need to be used. You may have a bleeding during the procedure, so you. it is a good idea to have two large bore cannula and in a, and in like any other case we have to ensure a good normoxia normocardia normotension and normothermia positioning is important and we need to be careful uh, while positioning and there is a possibility of uh, accidental extubation if we do not handle it properly then we have specialized <clears throat> monitoring like intraarterial bp or central venous pressure need to be monitored then muscle relaxant uh, should be given uh, depending on the need and the type Uh, hypertension might be required because in some patients when there is a uh, increased bleeding and there is a flap needs to be done then uh, there may be blood loss and transfusion requirement might be there usually in our setup the blood trans loss is about 400 to 500 ml and usually managed without a blood transfusion it will all depend upon the extent of tumor and the expertise of the surgeon mostly and so you have to be careful and we have to arrange accordingly a uh, venous air embolism is a possibility and you have to be geared up for management and free flap are there in some patients so you need to be uh, aware of the management of the free flap and uh, in the post operative period then positioning uh, generally head up position which improves the venous drainage reduces the blood loss and clears the surgical flea then they are uh, since it is a prolonged surgery it will last somewhere between 4 to 6 hours maybe more so you need to do a padding of the pressure points it is very important otherwise you may have injury to the nerves and you might have pressure ulcers then usually the arms are tucked by the side of the patient so we need to be care uh, has to be taken for compression of the neurovascular structures then it's always a, um, a kind of um, decision we need to take whether we need to do a invasive monitoring of, of the blood pressure or not in these patients though blood loss is not a common this thing but if it occurs it is usually rapid and it may be due to neck dissection uh, patient might have a pre op radiotherapy which makes dissection very very difficult then surgery is close to big vessels so you might accidentally injure the vessel big vessel though very rare but it is a possibility and there may be dissection of the vascular structures like tongue and mandible so blood loss is a possibility and there may be frequent fluctuations because we are very near the carotid body and the sinus and this may lead to hemodynamic alterations so it is a good idea 
to have invasive blood pressure monitoring in these patients. In addition, these hypertensive conditions might be required because uh, we to reduce the blood loss. And so uh, this, this makes importance uh, of preoperative invasive blood monitoring. Then CVP monitoring, because there's a risk of venous air embolism so during neck dissection, so it, it may be a good idea. In addition, uh, it may help us to guide the fluid therapy. Then muscle relaxants uh, during surgery, IPPV is carried out uh, with. In some of the patients, basically, you may, might need to identify the nerves during the surgery. So, in, transiently, you may have to withhold a muscle relaxant so that uh, they are able to intraoperative uh, nerve monitoring is possible from the surgical line. Then, uh, we usually, as I told, the 15 to 30 degree header position is there. Uh, we can. Uh, which will help us to induce hypertension along with increasing the volatile anesthetic. We can use peripheral vasodilators and use a beta blocker as well. Then blood transfusion <clears throat> will depend upon underlying medical condition and possibility of risk of transfusion hazards are there. So we have to be very, very careful. And especially in cancer patients because uh, transfusion has been linked to a cancer recurrence. Then during uh, neck dissection, uh, so considering there's a pressure on the carotid sinus or ciliated ganglion, so you may have a bradyarrhythmia, sinus arrest, wide swings in blood pressure and prolonged QT interval. So one needs to be sure it is the best idea is to remove the stimulus to ask the surgeons to stop transiently. We may need to give a an local anesthetic at the site or a bagolysis using an atropine is a good, good kind of alternative, but should be uh, used as the last, uh, last thing uh, to do because usually it settles by cessation of the stimulus or giving an LA at the surgical site. Uh, then some of them have a free flap, so we need to monitor using a Doppler probe, and uh, there might be a possibility of return to theater, so the theater needs to be geared up in case of a graft failure. Venous air embolism uh, is a real possibility because of pressure in the neck veins is low, and they may usually open to the atmosphere, so you need to be sure how to detect it, what are the possibilities of hypoxia and hypotension and hypocarbia? So our vigilant monitoring is, is the essence. And once you find the possibility, the treatment has to be initiated. <coughs> so once the surgery is done, uh, another big challenge we face is uh, extubation. Uh, it is a difficult intubation to start with, and it is a more difficult extubation to end with. So you may eventually extubate if it is a small wide local excision, a small uh, anterior section of the tongue or carotid surgeries. However, most of the surgeries involving mandible maxillary reconstruction, base of the tongue, central arch, we uh, will suggest to do a delayed extubation. And we follow the DAS guidelines. Any guidelines you can follow. The idea is like intubation, you have to plan, plan for extubation. You have to identify the risk extubation category. Then you have to prepare, you have to optimize the cardiovascular, respiratory, metabolic, and neuromuscular uh, factors. Then we have to ask whether perform extubation is good to the patient. So, and what is the method? So, whether you do an awake extubation or we do a tachostomy, we do a postponed extubation or an advanced technique. In our setup, we generally use a uh, delayed extubation strategy. We extubate the next day and after 24 hours also. Once you find the patient is strictly, there is big edema, large dissection, we many a times extubate over an airway exchange catheter. Some of the patients, especially the central arch patients, uh, upfront tachostomy is done because of this lot of dissection, and these patients uh, do well with the tachostomy. So the technique will depend upon overall the surgery, the your experience, and overall available available equipment. <clears throat> or whatever is the setting, a delayed extubation is a good strategy because extubation is kind of an elective procedure and this, we should not hurry during extubation and we should always plan it properly. This is an important question which may come in an exam as a short note or a long question or a part of a long question. So you must be really thorough with an extubation guide. <clears throat> So this we have done. Then post-operative complication, we need to be, uh, they might be transient hypertension, like pain, airway edema, and hematoma. 
so we need to uh, ensure that throat packs are being counted in the post operative period they they're not in advertently left which may lead to obstruction we need to care for the airway the monitoring lines and catheters the flap monitoring and the pain management we, we may need to take a decision for starting the oral food and early mobilization and in addition of wound care tracheostomy care and pulmonary physiotherapy tracheostomy might be done depending on the uh, decision uh, based on extent of resection reconstruction and neck dissection surgical closure is recommended after or uh, in some patients and decannulation can be done in one week later on pain management is important and patients may have pain because of uh, surgical dissection then uh, you may use a combination of opioids multimodal analgesia nerve blocks or anesthetics many of these patients are already taking opioids because of uh, the disease per se and we may need to increase the doses in immediate post op period to for optimum pain management uh, then uh, some recent advances so recently the enhanced recovery uh, is the key so everybody is um, writing about surgical stress response recovery from surgical stress response and so in the head and neck cancer surgery also we have a not lot of recommendations which help us to ensure an enhanced recovery so basically eras for hn surgery involves the strategies to enhance recovery and prevent complications which delay recovery broad i'll not go into the details but broadly like any other eras pathway so we have preoperative intraoperative and postoperative uh, phases so in the preoperative phase counseling baseline nutritional status carbohydrate loading thromboprophylaxis antibiotic prophylaxis prenatal medications is the important key points intraoperatively we should ensure hypothermia management fluid management and multimodal analgesia and in the post operative period po and we have prophylaxis icu admission multimodal analgesia ambulation flap monitoring wound care physiotherapy catheter management and tracheostomy are the key essentially the strategies are more or less similar irrespective of the surgery with subtle changes you must broadly know about the eras pathway it comes as a question in some form or the other in the theory exam and it becomes important for the practicals as well then a word about robotic head and neck cancer surgery so advantages are we have reduced blood loss in improved cosmesis reduced pain early recovery we may be able to do a difficult to reach lesions but the problem is that careful airway management needs to be done during the robot assembly and actual surgery so you can see so many instruments in the oral cavity and you are cannot be near the airway of the patient it is a very high chance that you may end up losing the airway and it can be really tricky then anesthetic circuits are very very large to uh, because you cannot be near the patient so they can be a delayed a response to change in etso2 and we are may not be able to detect em embolism in time so we need to be very very careful and we must know how to quickly dedock dedock the robot in case of an emergency so to conclude the main difference between anesthesia for major head and neck surgery and body cavity is that because major head and neck cancer surgery is a kind of superficial surgery so patients with a greater comorbidity can still be treated a head and neck cancer patient uh, is unique that we need to share the airway which is the most important thing for anesthetists with the surgeons and we need to be very very careful importantly there are greater chances of encountering a difficult airway and which must be anticipated and we need to or require a pre operative formulation of the airway management plan then anesthesiologist should plan an extubation strategy after surgery in consultation with oncology surgeons a delayed extubation strategy may be required in larger resections and we need to have a close liaison with an oncology surgeon plastic surgeon intensivist physiotherapy psychologist to have a multidisciplinary approach and a fruitful uh, kind of outcomes in this patients some of the exam questions it is a long case it may come as a short case only as a difficult airway a wake tracheal intubation is a big question in itself pre oxygenation para oxygenation how to do airway blocks extubation eras pain management in patient with head and neck cancer so all these kind things can come in the pre op or the post op in the theory or the practical examination uh, 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 the, we have come up with this book uh, uh, south asia edition uh, adapted to local practices the clinical an anesthesia by parash everybody knows about parash now me and anju have uh, adapted this to the south asia asian market and we have uh, done a lot of uh, 
chapters, uh, new chapters have been added, and we have added content uh, suited to our settings in this as well. So, students, best of luck. Uh, any questions you can ask me on WhatsApp or my email address. Thank you very much.